All right. Let's do immuno, fun stuff. Um, yeah, I know this is new for a lot of people um, if, you, if you didn't take it in undergrad, but Dr. Ramos, her questions are very straightforward, first, second order type stuff, very definition based. So that's what I'm gonna focus on. I think I've explained this before. The way this is taught as an introduction is almost like reading every other page or every other chapter of a book. It's like they give you a little bit of information and then you jump from innate immune system to T cells to B cells and everything. So um, you can't really paint a full picture. So you're just kind of getting little snippets to kind of get the uh, general understanding because when you get to turn four and you start talking about pathologies, um, it starts to all make sense. So that being said, um, let's do this. Okay, I just wanted to show you one thing real quick. The term three additional resources. Uh, um, if y'all go to my notes, Obviously my con consolidated notes are here, like the definitions, um, but also I put the Jeopardy. These are the answers. If y'all wanna just, these are super important. These are like pretty good, right? For the test, I would, I would make sure to know these, um, these different, um, these definitions um, for sure. 100%, 1000% do them. And then these key points too. This is, uh, she did this very quickly. We snapshot of these, uh, took a snapshot. So just make sure you know these two um, and that'll take you far. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So when we start out, we talk about uh, immunology, we have to branch into the innate immunity, uh, innate immunity versus adaptive immunity. So when you think of innate immunity, that is basically the same in all of us. There's no memory to it. It's kind of like, you know, if you want to think that the cells are kind of like the army, they're your first line defense. If there's any sort of infection, regardless of what it is, that's what's going to be uh, going to try to um, alleviate the problem, right? There's no uh, there's not a lot of, of, of premeditated thought. It's just like, let's get to the infection. Let's do what we can to uh, isolate it, to kill it, to, uh, um, to prevent it from uh, going out systemically, okay? So um, uh, kind of, uh, contrarily to, to that, the adaptive immunity is gonna be your memory cells, right? So this is gonna be like, when you get some sort of infection, uh, is your body able to make uh, these memory cells to be able to recognize it if it happens again. So this is uh, more of an advanced system. Um, these are when we talk about our B cells, our antibodies and our T cells and how they develop. So it's going to be more of a long, long-term response. So this is gonna be different between person to person, depending on what you're exposed to, what vaccines you have and whatnot. So uh, the innate arm, again, we're talking about those phagocytic cells. We all know macrophages, neutrophils, uh, they're gonna go to the site of infection. A lot of times it's bacteria. Just when you think of bacteria, you just think of a ton of cells. Just you want to just eat them up as soon as possible. Whereas viruses are kind of like a little sneaky, right? So you may need some sort of adaptive immunity to kind of counteract them. Um, so yeah, so the first line is always going to be your skin, uh, any sort of physical barrier, and then the second line to def defense is going to be this innate arm, this innate innate response to everything. So primarily you're thinking of your granulocytes, your neutrophils, basophils, uh, eosinophils, your macrophages, stuff like that. And then when we talk about um, the uh, adaptive immune system, it's uh, more of a long-term response. We have our cell mediated immunity, like our CD8 cells uh, and um, antibody mediated mediated, so like our B cells and our plasma cells. So yeah, again, you get this, this memory formation. So if you get a virus one time, you wanna be able to recognize it if you get it again. So whereas the first time you get an infection, it may last this specific viral or bacterial infection, it may last two weeks. If you can develop memory to it, the next time you fight it off, you can knock it out in like three days. So, and there's a lot that goes into uh, the adaptive immune system because how does your body actually form this memory? How do you even recognize it? How are you able to form cells that are just floating around long-term to be able to uh, identify it? And we'll get into that. And y'all will get into that a lot more towards the final as well. So 
as you would expect, the innate immune system is going to be quick. You can respond to it in hours, whereas the adaptive immune system has to form this memory. Um, but as I said, when you have a response to this, uh, to a repeat infection, the adaptive immune system is going to be those memory cells that are like, okay, we've seen this already. We need to be able to address this. Um, and again, these lymphocytes, the lymph nodes are going to be where these antigens and antibodies uh, come together and you're able to um, isolate it, right? So I guess that's a good point. Let, let's, let's look at this. And I just want to, this is very basic, but I, I want to make sure you understand. So like the antigen is from the virus, right? So if we, if we, this, or, or sorry, sorry, so it's, it's from the infection. So virus, bacteria, whatever, right? So if we say that the infection, let's say the, the virus is a car, the antigen could be like a tire or whatever, whatever the body can recognize uh, in the circulation, that's actually your antigen. And your antibodies are what the body makes in response to the infection, right? So like I said, the antigen, if the virus is a car, Maybe the antigen is the tire or the brake light, or for instance, for COVID, they use the spike protein, right? So the COVID virus has these little proteins on the side and they developed vaccine to this. So you would consider these little spike protein uh, an antigen, okay? So the whole point is if these antigens are floating around, the body needs to make memory antibodies. And by doing that, you can neutralize this complex. That's the whole goal, okay? So that being said, let me ask you this. If we, and hepatitis B is a good example for this. If you check, check the blood and you're positive for antigen, what does that mean? That literally means you have, so in, in regards to hepatitis B, that means you have an active infection, okay? You can't have antigen parts of the actual virus floating around if you don't have an active infection. So what if I said you have IgM? What does that mean? Well, we, we know these are antibodies and these IgMs are the first antibodies that are made and we'll get into it a little bit more later. But this means there's an acute infection, okay? So, let me just change colors real quick. If we say, we check the blood, we're positive for antigen, and we're positive for IgM, all right? Patient comes in. You could tell the patient, you have an active infection, right, because of the antigen, but you have also uh, started making antibodies, right? These IgMs, these are the first antibodies made. Now, what if you tell the patient to come back in a couple of weeks, your antigen's negative, IgMs are negative, but IgGs are positive, all right? You could tell the patient, since there's no antigens there, you, the virus isn't present, okay? You've cleared the virus, but, and then, and then IgM, isn't present, but IgGs are. So remember this class switching is the change from one antibody to the other. So when you switch from IgM to IgG, you're, uh, you're showing long-term immunity. So your IgGs are long-term. So this is gonna be, so you've cleared the infection, but you've developed some long-term immunity. So for now, that's, that's gonna help you uh, understand this idea. Uh, so remember that IgM, in, in order to have this long-term immunity, this IgM to IgG process has to happen. And this is that this, the phenomenon of class switching. Switching, okay? And then aid, if we'll get to that, but the aid is what aids in, in doing this. Okay, so the point I wanted to make is uh, you can actually take serum, you could take the different uh, components of this and look at the patient and you could see uh, what exactly is going on. Well, you could even say, well, well what, if, what if the antigen's present, so we have an active infection, but IgG's pregnant, uh, pregnant, <laughs> present. 
So not only is the antigen there, but why do we have long-term immunity as well? So that could be a sign of chronic infection. You've had time to develop these long-term antibodies, but you've also, uh, you, you still the, the antigen and the virus is still present. So with hepatitis, any sort of chronic infection can lead to liver disease. So these are the point, this is the point of understanding these differences in antibodies and whatnot. And we'll touch on it a little later. I just think a general overview kind of helps me piece things together. Okay. So as I mentioned before, these granulocytes plus the macrophages, there's going to be our quick response, the innate system, the cells of uh, the adaptive system, your B cells, T cells, that's going to be our memory, again, antibodies. Cytokines and complements go with both. They kind of tell everybody where to go um, and uh, when there's supposed to be an infection. And I'll touch on the important ones there. So we can break it down into, and this is important, this myeloid progenitor and the lymphoid progenitor. Myeloid is gonna include all your granulocytes plus your macrophages. Remember, monocytes float around in circulation. Once they get into tissue, they change into macrophages. Your lymphoid progenitors are going to, uh, well, they're gonna be not only natural killer cells, but they're also gonna be B and T cells. But we're looking at the innate system, which is in red here. So the, the natural killer cells are components of the innate system. Okay, this is from first aid. And this is what I wanna point out because I don't want y'all to get confused. Just because they're like, the fact that they're granulocytes versus agranulocytes doesn't determine whether they're myeloid or lymphoid, okay? Because in this myeloid progenitor, you have three granulocytes, but you also have macrophages, which are agranulocytes, okay? So don't, don't get that confused. The lymphocytes are B cells and T cells and natural killer cells. Also, don't get confused with the idea that myeloid is going to be the innate system and lymphoid is going to be the adaptive system. Because remember, these natural killer cells are part of the innate system. Okay, so you can't, you can't compartmentalize it that easily. Um, so of the lymphoid system, B and T cells will be adaptive, but the natural killer cells will be part of the innate system. Okay, and remember, when we talk about these granules, those are going to be important because uh, they help to... Um, determine what actually cell lineage is gonna develop, okay? And then um, those are actually gonna be what helps to fight off the infection in the innate system. All right, so uh, just a couple more definitions. If you think of the antigen, I like the example of think, saying like the antigen's like a lock, right? So you have to make an antibody that fits the lock. So if the antigen is the lock, the epitopes would be like the little um, like the little parts that, that the key fits in, like the little ridges, right? So um, these epitopes are like the little pieces that stick off of the antigen that, you could, that your body is trying to identify. These, these, um, these very specific things that are to the, to the virus or the bacteria that you can help differentiate it from other things. Now you can also have haptins, which are very small molecules, but if they're added to a, uh, a carrier molecule, then they can be identified as, um, as an antigen, okay? And then you could develop an immune response. So these are all little components that make up the antigen or can make up the antigen um, uh, that you can identify. Now, this is a super important slide and this is important not only for the antigen, but we think about it a lot when we look at the vaccines, okay? So it's very important and the size, is, size does matter. So the size that they like is 100,000 Daltons, okay? That's kind of the minimum size they like for to develop a vaccine because you want to develop a immune response to it. So if it's too small, they just, it just won't. Now, the dosing is kind of weird because you could say, well, you want a lot of it um, or maybe not, right? You, you, depending on how virulent it is. But the idea is to get it intermediate. Too low of a dose, you, you might not mount a response and too high of a dose, you can develop a tolerance to it or you can actually convert it to an active infection. So uh, intermediate is kind of where you wanna fall in that range. Now route, if you consider uh, how vaccines are given, we usually do it uh, subcutaneously, sub-Q. So, and you could do also do it intraperitoneal. Uh, even intravenous, but ideally you do it subcutaneous. Complex composition allows for immunity to develop. If it's simple, it's gonna be similar to other things in the body and you won't be able to 
um, isolated. So you want it to be complex. So anyway, the point is, if they give you a question, I'm sure y'all came across some practice questions where they said, um, uh, you give this this specific vaccine, it's 50,000 Daltons and you, you, know, you give it orally, uh, would it work? And it's like, well, no, you're not gonna mount a response because it's not large enough. Now, also remember, if you do it subcutaneously or even IV, you're gonna get a systemic response. If you give it, um, if you give it orally, you're going to get a mucosal response. So typically, they like to give vaccines subcutaneously. Um, point being, make sure you know these because I'm sure y'all will get a question regarding that. Now, neutrophils, y'all remember from back in the day, um, five, they have five, like five lobes. Um, now, the main thing you need to know now is they have this. They cause it a perlent discharge, right? Which is pus. Anytime you see pus, that's dead neutrophils, okay? So that's a dead giveaway. They go through this, um, this phagocytosis process and this neutrophil um, extracellular trap, I believe, right? It helps to um, isolate the bacteria. So this is the first sign of some, usually it's bacterial, be, bacterial because that's how you get pus. So any sort of bacterial infection, you would expect neutrophils to uh, be the first um, um, white blood cell or leukocyte on uh, uh, response. Now, eosinophils, remember those, those are bilobe. Typically, we talk about these in regards to parasitic inf in infections. Um, they also do antigen antibody complexes with some of those. Um, uh, when you develop those a lot of time, well, y'all will get into um, Y'all will get into the immunology of like lupus and stuff like that. But for right now, I think it's important to know any sort of parasitic infection, also allergic reactions. People that have asthma classically have increases to eosinophils, okay? But the point is somebody comes in and they're sick and you're wondering why they keep, why they have weight loss, why they have this fever and you get you know, you know, a CBC and you check the eosinophil or you check the CBC and they have a raised eosinophil count, that could kind of lead you to a parasitic infection, okay? Or maybe there's some sort of underlying allergy going on. So it's important to know that. Um, another one, remember we talked about, I, I mentioned these granules. You want to know these, it's specific, specifically major basic protein. That's kind of the characteristic ones they talk about um, with eosinophils. Basophils classically rolls in allergic reactions, okay? Why is that? Well, histamine, as you know, is a major player. Whenever you have some sort of allergic reaction, you get a histamine release. Those are these little granules in here, some of them. And when the histamine's released, it causes massive vasodilation, it causes flushing. And a lot of the uh, cell mediators can leave circulation. Um, like vascular permeability, so they could leave circulation and go to the tissue. Heparin's a blood thinner, y'all are familiar with that. Um, so it kind of helps with, with that process too. By thinning the blood, it helps with the extravasion of, um, of the mediators, okay? Mast cells, I put this in here for completeness sake. Um, similar to basophils, you could find them in connective tissue and stuff. Now, we could talk about the agranulocytes. Now you could see that here. Um, and they're gonna be mononuclear, right? So they don't have any, any bilobed uh, nuclei. Um, now specifically, remember macrophages, even though they're agranulocytes, they fall in the myeloid lineage, okay? And you know all about these, uh, y'all have learned this before, depending on where um, the monocyte goes uh, into tissue, the macrophage is called something in different areas. So it's good to know those, but y'all have come across that already. All right, now, Again, Dr. Ramos's stuff is pretty straightforward when it comes to like uh, definition. So there's not a lot of crossover. Like you won't find certain cytokines or certain interferons in one pathway and in another. It's very delineated, okay? So for instance, interferon gamma, gotta know it, she loves that. Um, it'll come up on the exam. Uh, that's going to push the macrophage to your M1. That's the classic macrophage you would think of, pro-inflammatory. Th1 response, which we will get to in a little while. Um, and then it's also going to be an APC, which we will also get to, get to in a little while. Remember, Th1s commonly deal with intracellular pathogens, okay? So this all kind of paints a picture of what we're dealing with. Th1, intracellular once you get that uh, intracellular um, killing, then you can have an antigen 
uh, presentation to B or T cells. Now, M2 macrophages uh, may not have heard of before, but these are almost, these are, these are have an anti-inflammatory process. When you think of anti-inflammatory, IL-10 is a big one, okay? So the way I like to think of it is when the macrophage goes to M2, you really use IL-4 and IL-13 to kind of tell the macrophage to become an M2 macrophage. And then this IL-10 kind of promotes this anti-inflammatory. So too much of a good thing, is a bad thing, right? So not only do you have to have inflammation, but you have to help have something to kind of calm it down. Now, T2 response does deal with parasites. So keep all these little things in mind, T1, intracellular, T2, parasites, stuff like that. Okay, IL-10, anti-inflammatory. And these things will come up again and again. Now, dendritic cells are underappreciated. These are the main players when it comes to antigen presentation. They have these dendrites. They can grab onto a lot of antigens. Um, they're like the tattletale, right? They can, they're gonna go through circulation, find whatever's going on and go tell the T cell uh, what's going on. CD14, I have a, there's a slide with what the, the different um, CDs you need to know. Uh, but yeah, so think of it as surveillance, right? They're the hall monitor. Um, so they're gonna deal with uh, presentation primarily to T cells, okay? Now natural killer cells, where does it fall? Remember you go into the lymphoid lineage, but they deal with uh, the innate immune system, okay? So these are gonna be important to know, CD16, CD56, natural killer cells. Straightforward, they go and kill um, uh, things at site. And uh, I, I do believe they actually act as antigen presenter cells, but not as readily as other, um, other cells. Um, yeah, so the main ones you need to know in regards to antigen presenting cells are the dendritic cells and macrophages. And then also a little later on, these B cells can actually be professional uh, antigen uh, presenting cells, okay? So they're gonna internalize these antigens and they're gonna be able to present them as well to other B cells to make antibodies uh, primarily, okay? So keep those in mind. Um, and like I said, this is, as you go on, this is gonna come a lot clearer. This is, they're just trying to paint a picture for you guys uh, to know what's going on. Now, some people use the, um, well, first let's, for whatever reason, they, they want you to know this, that for MHC class one, you have three alphas and a beta two microglobulin. Just know it. For MH2, you have two betas, two alphas, right? Um, so this is kind of what sticks out, this, this, uh, this MHC complex, and it allows the antigen presenting cell to bind so that it, it could be um, you know, uptaken into the, um, um, the B cell or the T cell for uh, longer lasting immunity. Okay, so um, some people, well, I should, okay, yeah. So some people like the rule of eight. So MHC class one, I'll just, it's like uh, MHC one goes with CD8 and MHC two equals CD4, your helper cell. So two times four is eight, one times eight is, uh, Right, so that's a good way of, of knowing it. Um, this is from first aid. Again, for whatever reason, they want you to know this. And you can see that little binding pocket, right? So in between these right here, this is where the peptide or that, um, that the antigen presenting cell can present the antigen, right? And you can see kind of the different characteristics here. Um, yeah. All right, so let's go into the adaptive immune system. And again, this is a bit more complex. It takes time to develop this adaptive immune uh, response because you're trying to develop memory to it. So uh, you have to know the site. So both B cells and T cells are made in the bone marrow, but T cells will migrate to the thymus to mature. B cells will mature in the bone marrow, but then they leave to go to the lymph node uh, for antigen. That's where the antigens are presented to the B cells, okay? So you can either develop a memory B cell or the B cell can turn into a plasma cell where it's just pumping out antibodies, okay? Um, like I said, the T cell is gonna be the thymus um, and you're gonna develop these effector T cells or memory T cells 
Uh, so similar to the B cells, it's just a, it's a different process, which I'll look get to after the midterm uh, in more detail. So you have these T helper cells, uh, the, the, C, the cytotoxic T cells are your CD8 cells. Those are gonna be with the cell mediated immunity. And then you have T regulatory cells, which we'll get into in a second. So this is the, this is the idea. You have this antigen presenting cell. It can present to either the CD4 or the CD8, right? So remember MHC2, is going to present to the CD4, right? Two times four is eight. You will find MHC2 only on antigen presenting cells, okay? So these antigen presenting cells are going to present to the CD4 helper cells. And from that point, you can go through the process of developing effector and memory cells, right? So they're helping, right? They go through the process of helping the process of making this uh, differentiation to these other cells. Now, in contrast, MHC1 is found on all the nucleated cells. So it's gonna to present to the CD8 cells and these CD8 cells are going to be your cytotoxic T cells. So I like to think of the CD8 cells as like your Navy SEALs, right? They're, they're uh, able to go and I think there's a slide on it uh, explaining it a little better later, but they're able to go and they attack intracellular things such as viruses. So that nucleated cells come to them. They say, look, something's going on. The CD8 cells take this information and they can go intracellularly. They can release the granzymes and kind of get out without being seen, right? Um, and here we go. So these T cell receptors are what sticks out of the outside. So the, of the CD4 cell and then, um, the antigen presenting cell can present to this MHC class two. And again, for this, you're worried about extracellular and phagocytized cells, okay? Primarily think of extracellular. Whereas I said with the CD8 cells, Navy SEALs, they go intracellular, they dive into the cell, they figure out what's going on. These antigen presenting shell cells are just gonna present the antigen, uh, this extracellular antigen that they found to the class two and this TD4 helper cells are then gonna go through the process of making memory cells. Okay, and like I said, you can see the contrast here. This is what she's gonna test, Dr. Ramos is gonna test you on, right? So let me just go, go back, right? So class two presents the CD4, they deal primarily with extracellular things, okay? Cytotoxic T cells, CD8 deals with class one, they're gonna deal with viruses, intracellular problems. Primarily viruses are intracellular, right? That's how they replicate. So these are like, like I said, like your Navy SEALs, okay? I had a question, Brady. Yeah, sure. So back to when on that one slide, you had the macrophages polarization. How does that, does that, that seem to kind of- Wait, I'm sorry, which slide? Uh, the macrophage polarization where the M1, M2, you said the T helper one response would is the killing of intracellular pathogens, but I, I assume that T helper cells would- No, extracellular. The, yeah. T, T helper cells deal with class two, deal with extracellular. Right, but on your other slide, on the macrophages polarization, when you have, when it goes to the M1 macrophage, you says it's killing of intracellular pathogens. I just didn't know if they're somehow- uh, Okay, well, so we're, we're talking about two different things here. Uh, um, the, the macrophage, this is, we're, this is when we're dealing with macrophages, okay? So the macrophages can deal with, um, can deal, okay, so like these M1 macrophages can deal with um, intracellular pathogens. They kind of just eat them up. Now here, uh, when we're talking about this, we're talking about T cells. Okay, so these, these now, now we're not talking about macrophages, those M1 macrophages anymore. We're talking about T cell presentation. So at this point, the macrophage is, is gonna be the antigen presenting cell to the T cell. So let's say we take an M1 macrophage, it eats up the intracellular, right? And then it sticks out that antigen on its surface. It's gonna go and it's gonna uh, provide that antigen to the CD4 cell, okay? That extracellular antigen to this T CD4 cell. From there, the CD4 can go make memory T cells to that. So it's just a different cell lineage. Okay, thank you. No worries. All right, and you can see here, uh, this is a nice little diagram. But so let's, again, we're just gonna harp on this point. MHC2 deals with T helper cells, right? These two, MHC2 presents to the CD4 helper cells. And from this point, we're releasing cytokines, okay? This process, this activated T helper cell can release cytokines. 
cytokines. Now, again, I, I just like this analogy because you could kind of see the Navy SEALs here. MHC1, any nucleated cell, CD8 presentation to this cytotoxic T cell. Now the cytotoxic T cell has all the information it needs. It can go to the cell. It can attack intracellularly, could release these, put the bombs in there, the granzymes or the perforins and get out. And then the cell just kind of explodes. So it's pretty cool. Uh, Brady, just a quick question. Um, yeah. Could you differentiate CD4 and TCR? Um, I believe CD, the CD receptors, they're the ones that are um, responsible for recognizing the MHC classes and then the actual receptors that are on the T cells, are they responsible for then binding to the antigen? Yeah, okay, so uh, I might have a slide. Um, that, uh, so yeah, so they kind of work together. So the way I think of it is like, um, it's like the, C, the, the cell can bind. So, so take this one, for example, the CD8 cell. Any nucleated cell can go bind to the CD8, right? It's saying, I, it's saying, I am now binding to this CD8, right? And then from that point, it could kind of fit into the, the antigen, into the receptor. So like it's a two-point docking system, okay? I don't think you need to go into it much more than that, but yeah, like so, um, but yeah, you could kind of see like this, this cell has to, this, this, um, this antigen presenting cell has to first recognize this, C, this T cell as a CD4. So once it goes there and says, okay, I found a CD4, then it could dock the antigen into the T cell receptor. But it is a twofold process. It kind of has to go together, right? Okay, thank you. Um, now, again, T regulatory cells. The main thing you want to know here, like, to, again, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. So we need to regulate this response. You don't want this heightened immunity or any sort of autoimmune uh, response. So these T regulatory cells can also bind to antigen presenting cells. Now, the main thing you need to know here is that, again, our friend IL-10, IL-10 is gonna deal with uh, just numbing down the response, right? This anti-inflammatory response. So from that point, you can get, um, you, you can get a decreased immune response to that. Okay. And again, when y'all get to term four, a lot of this will make more sense, but you just kind of need to get the, the definitions down of what goes with what. What would you expect to see? Who would present to who? What, would, what are the CDs you would expect on these cells and whatnot? Um, now, again, this will ma maintain tolerance so, uh, so you don't attack yourself, again, so you don't develop any sort of autoimmune diseases. Um, this is super important. I, I seem to remember Dr. Reynolds not, not talking about it too much, but it is very important clinically because whenever, like I mentioned earlier with the eosinophils and the parasitic infection, whenever you get, um, these are the, the percentage of white blood cells you would expect in circulation. So any variance on that would indicate some sort of infection. If you have increased eosinophils percentage, you would expect some sort of parasitic, parasitic infection increased neutrophils, maybe it's a bacterial infection, basophils, some sort of allergies, um, lymphocytes could be some sort of virus. So it kind of points you in the right direction. Um, for now, knowing the percentages is fine, uh, but clinically, it's just not exactly straightforward. They actually use the, the actual count to see where they fall in the range. But if you could kind of, I would definitely know these, these percentages. Um, I think we talked about it in FTM. Um, so definitely knowing uh, what the actual uh, true percentages is will be good. This is important, but it's not as daunting as you think. Um, CD45, you'll find on all white blood cells. CD3, you're going to find on all T cells. Now, T helper cells, you would expect the CD4. Cytotoxic, right? CD8. Let's just review who's going to present to the CD4s are MHC2s, right? Who's MHC2s are antigen presenting cells such as macrophages, um, uh, those dendritic cells, maybe B, uh, B cells. Um, cytotoxic T cells, you would expect a CD8, who presents to them all nucleated cells with MHC1. So don't get stressed about the whys, why is this happening now? Just kind of get down the idea of what's going on um, and you know, kind of definitions of who falls where. And again, regulatory, I added IL-10 here. So yet, yeah, would you expect the CD3? Yeah, it's a T cell, right? It actually has a CD4 as well, so you can consider it a helper cell, but it also has CD25 and IL-10. This is, you have to know this, um, you'll see this a lot. 
some some lymphomas, B cell lymphomas, you get increase in these CD1920-21. That's always representative of B cells. And then just for completeness sake, it, it's probably good to know that 16 and 56, natural killers, and 14 and dendritics. Okay. So um, just commit this to memory. If you learn it now, you know it later. So you're good to go. Just in case they throw a histology slide at you, make sure the eosinophils are bilobed. Neutrophils are supposed to have five, but obviously this is in three dimensions. So it's kind of hard to appreciate one, two, three, four, five, I guess. Lymphocytes, uh, remember the nucleus takes up. Uh, you don't really get a big cytoplasm there. Monocytes are kidney shaped. All right, and then basophils obviously have all of our um, heparin and histamine molecules. What do we find in eosinophils? Remember I mentioned major basic protein. Okay, now hematopoiesis is the process of making blood cells, right? So erythrocytes, we've talked about this. Um, wait, did you, yeah, obviously I'll do that. Um, back when y'all did hematology and, and and stuff like that. Y'all will get into that more in term four, but um, remember red blood cells live about 120 days. That's how you do your hemoglobin H1C. That's why you can get three to four month um, a register of uh, patients' uh, glucose levels. And um, you're gonna primarily phagocytize these in the spleen. Um, and so remember they go through those sinusoids in the spleen and they have to bend. So older red blood cells, if they can't bend enough, they just lice, which is what's supposed to happen. White blood cells, depending on if they're memory cells versus you know those, those neutrophils that, uh, so neutrophils would go like a day because they just, they attack, the innate immune system attacks and then goes away. And then you have some memory cells that can last a long time. And then, yeah. All right, so just basic again, uh, B cells and T cells are both going to be made in the bone marrow, but T cells are going to go to be developed in the thymus. Secondary are going to be where you're going to have antigen presentation. Okay. Now the thymus is very interesting. I get y'all y'all get into the whole development a little bit later, but I'm going to break down the positive and negative selection thing for you guys. But just remember. As a child, you're gonna to wanna to develop a lot more T cells. Over time, around puberty, the thymus is gonna degenerate a bit, um, but the thymus is gonna be where these T cells develop. There's a blood thymus barrier. You don't want them exposed to um, just normal blood because they need to develop um, independently of any sort of uh, antigens that are in the blood. Um, and then secondary lymph nodes. The main thing that y'all are gonna be tested on here is, know what lives where. So what lives in the cortex, that's where you're gonna find your B cells. Um, I think even the histology slide of this is fair game, kind of knowing what is what. Remember those germinal centers of those big round spots you can see. Paracortex, that's where your T cells are. And then the medulla um, plasma cells, right? So the developing B cells go to the medulla. All right, and in these lymph nodes, that's where you get antigen presentation. Everybody meets up. Antigens are presented, APCs present the antigens, and then those B cells primarily, or T cells can, uh, well, the B cells can develop antibodies, the T cells can develop uh, memory T cells, okay? Um, just in case, I feel like you should know this, this is just the process of the blood, or sorry, the lymph flowing through. Uh, so you obviously afferent comes in, efferent goes out, and that's the process. I seem to remember that there was a question. It might have been an IMCQ about what comes after the afferent. It was subcapsular, but um, just know that. All right, and then in the spleen, again, what lives where? Red pulp, red, red blood cells, white pulp, white, white blood cells. So those where your T cells are. Those follicles that you find are going to be your B lymphocytes. And very importantly, uh, the marginal zone is where you're going to get antigens and APCs meeting. Okay, so make sure you know that. And then another, uh, y'all are familiar with the malt. Malt is kind of an umbrella term for the secondary lymph organs, bronchial, gut, skin. Uh, y'all are familiar with gallt, like payers patches in the ileum. Uh, those are going to be lymphoid tissue. So you can get antigen presentation there, these microfold or M cells. All right, so remember it's a three-part defense. Um, the first line is just going to be any sort of barriers, right, are, are, that, that are formed. And then second line is going to be the innate system. 
from there, these are acquired or specific as our third line defense where we have our adaptive immunity. All right, so um, this response process, these PAMPs and DAMPs can are acting as antigens. So when these antigens bind to these uh, receptors, that's how they come in and you're able to develop antibodies to them. All right, and these toll-like receptors are gonna be what binds the antigens on the outside of the phagocyte. So this is still the innate immune system. Uh, these toll-like receptors are gonna stick out and then um, the antigen can bind that. From that point, so this is extracellular binding. So you're thinking those, like those M1 macrophages, uh, this extracellular binding, and then it can be taken in and it can be processed. Now, the processing of this may involve um, sticking it back out as an antigen presentation, but it needs to be brought in first to be processed. All right, and you could see the whole um, phagocytosis process. So again, you could see kill the bacteria. So two goals, one, kill the bacteria, and two, can we find something unique to this bacteria that we could present so that we can identify it easier next time? And that's the point. All right, and again, these phagocytes are gonna be your neutrophils and your macrophages. Uh, opsonization is a important process. You're kind of tagging the cell to be destroyed, right? So these are uh, um, primarily C3B is gonna be the one that you talk about a lot, but if you uh, if you can tag the anti um, if you could tag the um, the um, the infection of interest, so the bacteria or the virus of interest, then you can kind of tell it. You know, it reminds me of the eye cell disease where you where you tag it with mannose six phosphate to be destroyed. This opsonizing process, you're kind of like tagging it, telling the, the, it to be phagocytized. Okay, so it's just uh, an efficient process of of uh, identifying it and getting rid of it. So again, the main one you wanna focus on the C3B, that's gonna be your opsonizer. Um, I feel like the questions will be straightforward if they bring that up or some sort of C3B deficiency, whatever happens, you can't opsonize the cell. All right, now there's phagocytic, phagocyte, phagocytic killing, right? So you have oxygen independent. If you're not dealing with oxygen, you're primarily dealing with some sort of enzymatic response. So lysozymes, so things like lysosomes, lactoferrin, I think you find that in the mouth, in the saliva, and these proteolytic enzymes. So you're not using oxygen, um, mostly um, enzymes. Now there is the oxygen, you've learned about this already too, this oxidative burst, um, NADPH oxidase, uh, this comes into play when you talk about like um, G6PD deficiency, right? That process of like making NADPH oxidase, but there is an NADPH oxidase deficiency that you need to be aware of. What you're worried about is ca catalase positive infections. I don't know that you need to know the reason, but if you're curious, um, these catalase positive infections, uh, they actually use the host um, hydrogen peroxide. And so if you have this deficiency, you can't kill them properly. It's probably not important. The whole important thing is that um, these catalase positive infections are what you're worried about because you don't have um, a response. You're not able to kill it uh, because you can't develop hydrogen peroxide. And um, the big thing, I put a star, uh, which reminds me, uh, I would not doubt that you get at least one question. I think we've got at least one question from each of the diseases. Um, in uh, immunology. So uh, make sure you know those, you can identify those, they're all in the slides coming up. So make sure you know, so chronic granulomatous disease deals with NADPH oxidase. Now, why does, why does that make sense? If you, if you can't kill the cell with, with hydrogen peroxide, you don't have NADPH oxidase, you can't, you can't kill the bacteria, right? So the only thing you could do is make a granuloma, okay? So the idea is that if this is our bacteria and you use hydrogen, you know, NADPH uses hydrogen peroxide to kill this bacteria, right? It's supposed to kill it. Now, if this, if this doesn't work, right? The only option for you is to take that bacteria and form a granuloma around it, right? That's what a granuloma is. You're saying, I'm not able to kill this bacteria. The only thing I could do is wall it off. So a good example, now not an example of the NADPH oxidase problem, but the, an example of 
granulomas is tuberculosis, right? It's very hard to kill tuberculosis. So what the body does, it tries to wall it off. It makes a granuloma around it, kind of isolates it. But it's good to know because that'll help you remember that um, if you have an NADPH oxidase deficiency, um, you're prone to forming granulomas. So you have chronic granulomatous disease. You can't kill the bacteria. You have to wall it off. That process of walling off is making a granuloma. Okay, and definitely know this too, this uh, nitro blue tetra tetrazoleum test. Know that in chronic granulomas disease, you don't have the hydrogen peroxide, so you can't convert the yellow to blue. So in chronic, chronic granulomatous disease, it stays yellow, okay? All right, another good one that you need to know is Chediak Higashi syndrome. So uh, this is the problem in forming the phagolysosome. So after the macrophage or whatnot, the phagosome uh, engulfs the cell uh, it has to fuse with the lysosome because the lysosome has the enzymes to break everything down. So if you can't do that, uh, you're not able to get rid of the, the, the particles that you ingest. So I think the main thing to know is how they present albinism, neutropenia, periodontal disease, and recurrent pyogenic infections. Now, do not get pyogenic and pyrogenic confused. Pyrogenic means fever pyogenic, like this here, means bacterial, right? So these go together. Make a note of that. Um, anytime you're going to have neutropenia, you're going to have recurrent pyogenic infections. Why is that? Because neutrophils are going to kill these bacteria. Neutrophils form pus, right? So if you don't have neutrophils, you can get these pyogenic infections. Now, ideally, they'll tell you on the test, the person has albinism, right? Decreased melanin production. I don't actually know why that happens um, in these patients, but um, if they tell you that, dead giveaway right there, okay? Cool. Now, we could break down the inflammatory response. Y'all are familiar with this. Remember histamine, usually it's released in, as an allergic reaction from those basophils. Uh, this vas vasodilation, vascular permeability, uh, that's what causes the redness and the heat production uh, and the swelling. Uh, also uh, with the swelling, uh, bradykinin uh, stimulates pain, but also causes vasodilation. So the swelling, and we'll look at that when we talk about um, the angioedema in a second. And then resolution, obviously through the process, macrophages eat everything up and your lymphocytes will be your long-term for your memory cells. Super important here to know what goes with what. Selectins go with the rolling process. Integrins go with the activation process and these CAMs go with adhesion. So they could ask you a simple question. They could say, the body, the patient is deficient in selectins. What process is inhibited? The rolling process, okay? Or integrins activation. So easy points, just make sure you know what goes with what. All right, leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So uh, again, star, this is very important, this beta to integrin subunit. So um, yeah, these neutrophils cannot get out of circulation and fight, and, and fight infection. So somebody tell me, all right, so this is what you're gonna be looking at, these hallmarks, I might have actually just highlighted, hold on. Um, yeah, so recurrent skin infection, delayed umbilical hernia uh, separation, that's a dead giveaway. That's like albinism with Shadak Kagashi, right? If they say delayed umbilical separation, we're talking about this. But can somebody tell me if you got a CBC, what would the neutrophil count be? Anybody? It would be high. It would be high. Why is it high? Because your body ca is causing more production of them because it can't get to the infection. So it causes like mass hyperplasia of it just to try and get them to the site of infection. Right, exactly. So if we look at the vessel, remember CBC, we're checking the, the cells in the blood. If we have all these neutrophils, it's not a problem making neutrophils, it's a problem getting the neutrophils out to the site of infection, right? So if we have an infection up here, 
um, these neutrophils can't get out. So I don't want y'all to get confused. The point is you will get increased neutrophils here. Um, you just can't get them out of circulation. So yes, you're constantly making more, trying to fight the infection. You just can't get to it, okay? So that's important to know. I don't want y'all to get tripped up on that one. All right, so yeah, recurrent skin infections. Why? Because you can't get the neutrophils out of circulation to get to the bacteria on the skin. And then why, big giveaway here, why absence of pus? Neutrophils make pus, right? Those purulent infection, the pyogenic infection, that is pus formation. So if you can't, if you don't have neutrophils, none of that. All right, good summary here. The thing I wanna, oh, okay, I have that twice. Uh, thing I wanna point out here, um, very important, and this will come up again and again, acute inflammation, sorry, let me do it this way. Um, Acute inflammation is going to deal with IL-1, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. I added IL-6 there to your notes, okay? Um, let me just do this because this helps me um, just going forward this. So I would always get these confused, tumor necrosis factor and transforming growth factor. So this has necrosis in it, right? This N, and this has growth in it. Okay, so anytime you have some sort of active infection, this bad boy is gonna come first, right? Whenever you're going through the healing process, that's where you're gonna get to uh, transforming growth factor, okay? So that'll help you going forward. Um, Y'all may not have come across TGF yet, but that helps me. So again, um, acute inflammation. We're talking about IL-1, IL-6, tumor, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. You should wake up in the middle of the night and say that. Also, uh, any time of chemotaxis, particularly these neutrophils, IL-8, that's, that's our neutrophil chemotaxis, but um, IL-8, LTB4 and C5A are gonna be dealing with that. So write it down a hundred times if you need to, make sure you know those. Um, IL-8 is primarily going to be neutrophils, but these are all gonna be chemotaxis. What is chemotaxis, right? Chemotaxis is there's an infection, say in your skin, you have these agents, you have IL-8, LTB4 and C5A gonna be released. It's gonna tell the neutrophils that are in circulation or whatever, to go out of circulation to the site. So it's like, it's like a pin on when you're sending somebody uh, your location, right? A location of infection, you just pin it and they could find out where to go. All right, so this kind of breaks it down. Again, uh, uh, this is gonna be your chemotactic factors, right? IL-1, 6, tumor, uh, necrosis factor alpha, gonna tell you that there's an acute inflammation. IL-8, C5A, Lutetrine B4 is going to be chemotactic, particularly for neutrophils. Okay, check out first aid. They have it uh, nicely outlined for you guys. Vasodilation, uh, bradykinin, also histamine is used in that. Bradykinin also brings the pain. Uh, and then again, activated tissue macrophages, IL-1, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. What is that telling you? These macrophages are telling you you have an active infection that you need to deal with. All right, now chronic inflammation, time has gone on. Um, what you need to worry about is interferon gamma. Dr. Ramos loves interferon gamma, know everything about it. And tumor necrosis factor alpha will still be there. So interestingly enough, tumor necrosis factor alpha kind of just tell you there's, there's an infection. Not only is it there in the acute phase, it's still there in the chronic phase. But if they ask you something specifically to chronic inflammation, interferon gamma, is going to be a um, big player there, right? Granulomas, would you consider granuloma chronic infection? Yeah, because you didn't really kill the bacteria, you just walled it off. Interferon gamma is common in granulomas, granulomatous diseases, okay? Chronic inflammation. All right, interferon alpha. So the idea, primarily when you think of interferons, at least alpha and beta, you're thinking of viral infections. They kind of want to prevent this, um, this, this transition to neighboring cells, right? So if these interferons can be released, you can help to isolate or, uh, yeah, let's say isolate the, um, 
the virus to a specific cell. So you can't get this transferred from the, to the vir from, of the virus from one cell to the other. Okay, so think of that as viral. And then big star, interferon gamma, major player in chronic inflammation, but it has a lot of um, different properties. Yeah, we'll get a, a question or maybe more than one. Um, and remember, macrophages deal with granulomas. This is good. I'm bringing this up because it's term, the rest of term three and term four, big deal. Macrophages deal with granulomas. If we are talking granulomas, we're talking chronic infection, interferon gamma, chronic infection, okay? Everything works together. I mean, here we go, it's right, interferon gamma, granuloma formation. Again, macrophage, here's macrophages, yeah. Now, another thing uh, to note, these macrophages also um, secrete IL-1 and IL-12. Put those together with macrophages, put those together with granuloma formation, keep those together with interferon gamma, okay? I know it's a lot, but um, it's doable, you'll be fine. <laughs> until this part where we talk about this nonsense. Okay, um, so there's different pathways. The classic pathway is the adaptive pathway. Uh, the alternative and the mannose binding lectin pathway is uh, more of the innate immunity. You don't need to get bogged down with this, okay? The whole point is to get to a place where we can make C3 convertase, which they all do. Um, the alternative just goes through C3 the classic goes through C and the uh, mannose binding lectin goes through C1 to get to C3. And then eventually you make the MAC complex, right? The C9, C6 through C9 is gonna make a pore, right? They combine to make a pore, you put it in the cell, you, have a, you can have osmotic um, lysis, right? Once you make a pore in the, pore in the cell, and break the membrane. Don't get bogged down with this. I'm gonna show you all what y'all need to know in a second. Um, Right, like I don't know that's necessary to like whiteboard all this out. You just need to know the deficiencies that correlate with these. So one thing to know, again, classical pathway is adaptive. Okay, the other two could fall under the innate. Whole goal, make C3 convertase, right? Again, you make C3B. Why is that important? That's our major opsonizer. Okay, then you see this poor, this poor formation. C6 through C9. Alternative pathway, again, um, I'll, I'll propertin pro, pro pro um, is an important, maybe a keyword, just in case it's in the stem, but this is part of the innate immunity. Mannose binding lectin, you actually have these little lex, uh, lectin molecules that bind, okay? They're kind of isolated. And again, this is innate immunity. But what you read, oh, one more thing, MAC complex, reminds me of that song, I don't know, Return of the MAC. I don't know. I have to hear it every time I think of the MAC complex, so now y'all do too. So, um, so yeah, C6 through C9, gonna make this poor return of the MAC. There you go, attack complex. So definitely know which ones correlate, six through nine or C3, C5B through nine. Um, star on this slide, know what goes with what. MAC complex, right? C6 through nine or C5B through nine. Our major opsonizers, C3B, inflammation, C3A and C5A, uh, clearance, also opsonized, right? C3B, and then viral neutralization, not as, as important. But yeah, you get it. And this is just another explanation, but you can kind of see how they go together. It reminds me of the, um, what do you call it? The, the clotting cascade, right? They have their different branch points, but they come together to the centralized thing. But again, you don't really need to focus on this. What you need to focus on here are the, um, the deficiencies. So if you have a classical pathway or the adaptive pathway deficiency, you can get things like lupus, uh, glomerul, glomerul, nephritis, glomerulonephritis, sorry, that's the kidney problem. Um, in the glomerulus and vasculitis, you'll get into these later. Uh, there's a bunch of different ones that you have to know. Um, so just know what goes with what. So classic pathway can lead to this, these, sort, these sorts of diseases. <clears throat> the mannose binding less, la, um, lectin pathway re resorts in pyogenic infections. What are pyogenic infections? Bacterial, right? 
what fights off those uh, neutrophils? What does it form? Pus, purulent, exudate, okay? So those all go together. Um, uh, yeah, propertin, remember that has to do with, um, what do we say? Oh, you're the alt, wait, oh, the alternative pathway, yes. Okay, so you are prone to Neisseria infections. Make sure you know that. Encapsulated organs. Why is that? Well, C3B is required for opsonization. Because you can't, uh, these encapsulated org, uh, org, organisms um, are very difficult to kill. You can't opsonize it. It's hard to tell the body to kill it. Just a quick way I remember of, of knowing these is shin. I put this in the chat earlier. So strep, um, H influenza, influenza, and Neisseria. I don't know how to spell that. Yeah, close enough. Um, these are all encapsulated. Okay, so if you don't have C3B, you can't opsonize it. Right? So if you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you're prone to these. Okay, so remember Shin, staph, I'm sorry, so not staph, strep. Maphilus influenza and Neisseria. Those are the big ones. Um, and you see that with patients like um, sickle cell disease, um, they often get asplenectomy. Um, so they're uh, prone to that as well. All right, and then when we talk about the MAC deficiencies, again, Neisseria. Neisseria is a problem. What kind of symptoms would you expect? fever, even meningitis, remember stiff neck, if they ever talk about that, that's always meningitis. Okay, so MAC deficiency. So again, don't get bogged down. It is complicated, these different pathways. Just focus on if you have a deficiency in one of the pathways, what would what sort of infection or deficiency, what so if you have a deficiency, what sort of infections would that lead to? Okay, um, big one. I have a slide coming up, but this C1 inhibitor pathway, if you can't inhibit C1, you're gonna, you're gonna cause um, all this inflammation and you get this hereditary angioedema, okay? Um, also important, decay accelerating factor, uh, you get paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So they, it, the patients end up waking up with blood in their urine, happens at night. Uh, you don't need to know why right now, but just because of their ventilation slows down, they get metabolic acidosis. Um, so yeah, um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's important for that. So remember DAF correlates to CD55 and 59, okay? And then here's that hereditary angioedema. Um, what you see is this inflammatory process. So you don't have C1 inhibitor. You can't slow down this inflammation. You get a lot of bradykinin, you get, um, not, uh, not histamine, but you get bradykinin, so you get um, this increased swelling, this vasodilation, this vascular permeability, what you don't see is the rash. Urticaria is a rash. If this was, if you were to try to differentiate this from some sort of, um, some sort of uh, anaphylaxis or allergic reaction, if it was anaphylaxis, you would get histamine release and you would expect to see a rash, okay? So that's the whole point. What they'll probably ask you about is this. If you have someone with this C1 inhibitor deficiency, if you look at the pathway, they end up getting a reduced C4. Anybody with a reduced C4, uh, you should consider hereditary angioedema, okay? I'm pretty sure that's what they ask us about the lab values. And this is a nice little uh, diagram kind of explaining what goes with what. We got a star, you know it for sure. All right, um, why did I put this one here? Uh, I guess just, yeah, kind of just ex explains everything, what goes with what, if you want a little more explanation. Now, um, in circulation, B cells can, uh, um, well, not necessarily, usually not in circulation. We're talking about in lymph nodes, you get this, um, B cells can bind antigens. Um, so that's a normal process, but these T cells will not necessarily bind antigens. They have, on their own, they have to have antigen presentation, right? These APC cells. And um, 
Right, so that's what this says here. So this antigen has to actually present it to the T cells, whereas the B cells can grab onto it sometimes in circulation. So T cells always are gonna require um, this MHC presentation from the antigen presenting cell. So again, a lot of this is complex, but her questions were pretty straightforward. Like they were just asking basic definition type stuff. Okay, and so again, remember those dendritic cells float around, there's your surveillance, they're your hall monitors. They grab onto the antigens and they're going to present it to the T cells. All right, we talked about this already. Remember, class one is going to have three alpha chains and a beta two microglobulin. And then, um, yeah, and this kind of says here remember, MHC1 is going to bind CD8. Okay, you're going to deal primarily with viruses, intracellular stuff. Remember, CD8 is going to be our, our Navy SEAL. Go into the cell, drop gray enzymes, get out, cell blows up. Um, and then in uh, class two, uh, two alpha, two beta, it traverses the, the membrane two different places, right? Um, and remember these MHC2s are gonna only be on the antigen presenting cells. MHC1s will be on all nucleated cells. So remember that, keep those in mind. Um, good differentiator. And right, we talked about this already, right? CD8s go with MHC class one. CD4s go with class two. Um, and these APCs are gonna be deal with the, the class two, whereas all nucleated cells are class one. Now, this was an aggravating thing to try to work out, but this was the last slide in the lectures and I think it sums up everything well. It kind of paints a picture for you guys. Remember, if you keep everything organized, um, you can walk through the process. This process isn't super important. It's just important to know what goes with what, okay? So remember, CD4 cells, they're gonna have antigen presentation. They're gonna be primarily deal dealing with extracellular stuff. If it's extracellular, you have to take it in. You have to endocytosis. So you take this extracellular antigen you endocytosis, okay? It's confusing endocytic and endogenous. It's not the same thing. Exogenous means it comes from an, an outside source, an exogenous source. Endogenous means you're dealing with it on the inside. To get an exogenous source, you have the endocytosis, right? Right, pull it in, right? And then you get this, uh, right here, this invariable chain kind of hides the, the pocket for the binding cell Then this clip binds. It goes up here. Once the clip's removed, uh, the antigen could bind and uh, then you can form um, proper, you can then present um, or, or the, the T cell can develop further to, to make memory against it. Okay, so just know what goes with what. So this side, remember CD8 cells, um, they're going to, um, um, the, the, they have the, the MHC class one, all nucleated cells, gonna buy C, uh, CD8 cells. Now, the, remember the CD8 cells, like our Navy SEALs, are gonna deal with uh, intracellular stuff. So all this is intracellular, cytosolic, right? Cytosol is intracellular, endogenous, intracellular. So this is where we use our TAP protein and you develop the antigen. So the virus is already inside the cell, it's endogenous. You break it through the proteasome, you go through the tap, you're in the ER, and then you're able to then kick it out and present it, MHC class one, okay, to the CD8 cell. So you would consider this, a new, any nucleated cell could handle this, any um, antigen presenting cell would go through this process. So just keep them separate and you should be fine. Now, there are a few things to point out, one, some viruses don't, some viruses uh, cross over. So this is one of those weird exceptions. Um, some of these inactive viruses will go through the exogenous pathway. Now, let me go back. You would expect, since viruses are endogenous, you would expect it to be um, processed this way. Some of these viruses will actually go through this process. It's one of those things, everything's not exactly black and white. So just keep that in mind. I don't know that they'll ask y'all about that, but um, depending on the virus, um, it may go one way or the other. Now, there are two things that can interfere with this process. 
Uh, HSV, now straightforward definitions, just know what they do. HSV, uh, herpes simplex virus, will block the TAP protein so you can't, uh, you can't um, present the antigen properly. So this is through that uh, any nucleated cell, MHC1, CD8 process. So HSV can block the TAP. Um, adenovirus can also prevent um, the antigen from getting to the surface. So make sure you know these, these, are, these are both deal with that endogenous pathway. Makes sense because they're viruses, they should be on the inside. Okay, general summary. Read through it. Um, yeah, just try to don't don't get the words mixed up. Hey Brady, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Um, she had a slide that said the endocytic pathway or the exogenous pathway is lysosomal versus the cytosolic being non-lysosomal, and that confuses me sometimes. Like, yeah. why is that the case? <laughs> Yeah, you could, you could think of this endosome as sort of like a lysosome. Like you can see how the structure is built here. You have to break it down into its bare, bare products, right? So if you think of that as a lysosome, this, endoso this endosomal body coming through and then you lyse it down to get to your product so you could form antigens from it. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. No problem. Um, okay. Antibodies, right. So you don't need to get bogged down with this. You could do a whole term uh, on, on, you know, these, this, this processing, uh, you know, these antigenic processing. But the point is that these B cells need to make these antibodies so that they can identify antigens. So in this light blue region, you see your constant region. So what happens if you have a cell and you have a constant region your constant region is going to be inside the cell. Constant region doesn't bind anything, okay? Your variable region is what's gonna bind stuff, okay? That's terrible, but okay. That's what's gonna bind stuff. The constant part is constantly inside the cell. It's standardized, right? It just fits in the cell. You need the variable region to be different. It needs to look like the antigen, all right? So if they, like we said, the virus is a car. If the, if the antigen is the tire, right? A part of the car, this pocket needs to fit the tire, okay? So when that antigen comes in, this variable region the variability makes it specific to this, this antigen coming through so it could bind, okay? From that point, you can mount a response to it. Okay, so again, it's very complicated when you talk about how these actually form, but just remember the constant region is not gonna change, okay? This variable region is what's gonna actually bind the antigen. You can see right here. Then you have light chains and heavy chains. Again, you don't need to get too bogged down with this stuff. Um, now, yeah, so uh, just definition stake, you can have this constant region, which is the carboxy end, right? You remember when we talk about amino acids, you, you, you have the amino end and the carboxy end. The carboxy end is going to be the constant region that binds to the cell, and the part that sticks out, the variable region, will be um, um, the, the amino end, right? So the variability. And you could see this heavy chain and light chain. They just come together. Um, to allow this binding pocket right here. Now, um, this AB, uh, so, so remember the FAB is the part of the antibody that actually binds to the antigen. The C is goes into the cell. Constant domain goes into the cell. Antibody is actually gonna bind to this antigen, okay? On the amino end. And then, yeah, you can see how it kind of goes into the cell here. Remember when you're talking about these, um, I think I have a better slide. Yeah, so the heavy chain is gonna determine what actually, what the cell actually is, right? Um, so remember the, the initial response is you're gonna make IgM, uh, then you're gonna class switch and make IgG to have that long-term response. Uh, we don't really talk about um, uh, IgD. IgE is a uh, primarily allergic reaction, has, yeah. Um, and then IgA is going to be mucosal, right? So the mucosal lining, IgA crosses in breast milk, IgG crosses the placenta. So these are just little things that are good to know, but I think there's a slide coming up. Uh, this is just from first aid. You can kind of see uh, what they like to say about it. They have 
uh, fragment antigen binding, right? So that's the part that binds the constant region, carboxy terminal. So these are just uh, basic definitions for um, what regions do what. I put this in here just in case y'all get a question um, they could ask you. I'm pretty sure they asked this one of these. Maybe it was a practice question, but just know what correlates with what. Idiotype will be like the binding pockets. Isotype primarily is the constant region. All right, and you can see here, yeah, okay. So yeah, IgG is gonna be uh, your long, long acting cells, plasma cells are gonna be pumping those out. IgAs will be in your mucus, right? So in the linings, uh, mucus and serous secretion. IgM will be your first line defense, the first ones made. Remember IgM class switching to IgG is that important process for long-term immunity. And then IgE, um, I think of E kind of like eosinophils, even though that's not the same, but like E deals with allergies and parasites and so does eosinophils. So um, a good point to be made here, this J chain, the J stands for joining. Um, two of these antibody uh, uh, make complexes through the J chain. So IgA makes dimers through the J chain and IgM makes uh, pentamers through the J chain. They bind, it's just, that's just what they do. So you could get a question about that, but by making these, this, this pentamer, just more, more uh, availability to bind any antigens in circulation, all right? Um, like I said, I, made, I showed you all my condensed notes earlier. Go look at that. I, I wrote down like what, what's present in each of these because you could get a question like where the RAG1 and RAG2 stuff is and like all that nonsense. Um, but straightforward, it's just, unfortunately, it's one of those things you just have to memorize. But I wrote them out in my condensed notes, so y'all are welcome to go look at that. All right, all right. Another disease, um, this X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. Um, the point is, um, if you do not have this BTK, you can't properly develop this B cell, this B cell lineage. I'm sorry, you can't properly make antibodies from the B cell lineage, all right? So you're gonna get normal pre-B cell populations, but going from pre to immature and into the mature B cell, you won't get um, uh, any, uh, immunoglobulins. So if y'all remember that thing where we had like the acute phase, we had like albumin and then like alpha one, alpha two and beta. And then like there was supposed to be like this gamma, this gamma chain. Well, that was weird. Um, in Bruton's A gamma globulinemia, you won't get any gamma chains because you can't properly make these um, immunoglobulins. Right, so A gamma globulinemia means you don't have immunoglobulins. So you're at risk for a whole lot of infections, right? If you don't make those. Any sort of long-term long immunity with antibodies is kind of shot at stake. So just make sure if they talk about a person, I doubt they'll give you the, the albumin thing, but it may come in later um, just because that's how they actually test to see if you have immunoglobulins. All right, <sighs> now, Let's do this. All right, so now in the thymus, you have a T cell. And originally it's actually gonna have a CD4 and a CD8 on it. You have to go through two processes in the thymus to determine if the cell is good enough to go out in circulation and try to find other, uh, find any antigens or viruses or bacteria. So the first process is going to be positive selection. Now, this process is just going to say, is the T cell we made good enough to bind anything, right? It's okay if it binds your self antigens, but is it, you know, because you have to remember this process is very randomized. So they're going to make this random T cell with this random, uh, you know, complexes on it. And you're gonna to have to say, can this actually, is this a viable uh, cell to bind uh, um, molecules or antigens, right? Are they in circulation? So you go through positive selection and if they say they sell, yes, this can actually bind. It could bind self, it could bind uh, antigens in circulation. From this point, it's either delineated as a CD4 or a CD8 cell. So let's call it a CD4. 
Now, the most important point here is that it actually has to go through this negative selection process. So the worst thing is you don't want to put out you, selection. Sorry. Um, you don't want to put out cells that are going to bind you like yourself. So by negatively selecting, it's going to check to see if this if this cell is going to bind cell. So if it does not, no binding to self antigens, right? So red blood cells or whatever antigen. At this point, you could say, okay, we'll send this cell out into circulation. It's good enough to go. Okay. Now we'll, we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about some of the players that come into this process. Uh, uh, in a second, but that's just kind of the general idea. So you want to positively select it to say, okay, this is this is a viable cell. We can actually put it out. It's it's sustainable. Then you have to go through negatively so negative selection to make sure it's not going to bind your own your own cells, right? You just want to bind, uh, bind uh, foreign cells. All right. So that's that process. Now again, my condensed notes. I put these definitions in there. This is probably what they'll ask. Um, just straightforward, when you go through the negative selection process of recognizing self, air drives this process, okay? A-I-R-E, this regulator. It makes sense, right? This helps to prevent autoimmune uh, responses. You don't want to fight yourself, right? So you don't want any sort of autoimmune problems. So air will drive that process. And this kind of just shows you how it actually goes through the positive selection. Can it bind antigen presenting cells? Okay, cool, so positive, we'll use it. But let's check and make sure it doesn't bind self, go through negative selection. If it does, you kill it. If not, it's good to go. Okay, then this is just a good summary here uh, of like everything. Uh, don't get bogged down if you haven't seen some of these 21, 22, but um, just know um, kind of what goes with what. Okay, again, from first aid, this is the process of activation and class switching. Did y'all talk about hyper IgM syndrome? Do y'all know? Not yet. Okay, I wanna talk about it just because it makes a good example. Um, class switching, primarily we go from IgM to IgG. So this process, the point I wanna make is aid, aid, Aid will aid the process of class switching. Remember, we said that heavy chain is, is what's going to determine what we are, if we're M or G or whatever. So aid is going to help in this class switching. There is a syndrome you will talk about called hyper IgM, where you get increased IgM. Why is that? Well, that the problem is you can't properly class switch. So you get a ton of IgM but you can't switch to IgG, so you get no long-term immunity. So the point being is that aid is a big player in this class switching process. And in order to make these IgGs, this long-term immunity, um, class switching is gonna be uh, necessary. So this kind of talks about it there. Uh, after the midterm, y'all will get into CD40 and CD40 ligand and all that. And that's when y'all will talk about it, but it makes the point, right? If you can't class switch, that's the issue. The last lecture, I'm pretty sure we didn't have any questions on it. Um, this is very complicated, but the whole point is that um, you have, um, I, I don't know how many, it's like 50 or, or 500 different uh, um, genes or something like that. And But by combining them in different orders, you can have millions of different combinations. So the thing is the B cells will take the antigen, take it in and make antibodies to that antigen. The T cell just makes everything. So if the antigen, let's say is a lock, right? And you need to make an antibody for that lock, the T cell doesn't know what the lock looks like. So it makes millions of keys and floats them around just in case it'll fit the lock. It's kind of crazy. Whereas the B cell could kind of make a mold of it. If, it. if it catches it in circulation, it can make a mold of the lock and try to make the antibody to it. But the point is, the T cell is going to make millions of different keys to try to just in case it comes across something that it recognizes as non-self. So 
these VDJ recombination, this process is making a million different teeth on the key so that if it comes across that antigen lock, it can address it, okay? <clears throat> That's the best way I can explain it. Um, this is important because you need to know, uh, and this is what I illustrated in, in my condensed notes, but you need to know what is expressed where. So they could ask you where the RAG1 and RAG2 are expressed, your pro to pre, even through immature cells, but then it goes away. CD19 um, comes through. Uh, you'll originally see CD19 as a pro B cell, and then CD20 joins in as a pre. So we did have questions on this. You need to know, um, you know what uh, surface proteins and what um, gene expression correlates to what. And also, um, you don't see surface um, antibodies on these B cells until it's an immature, okay? Pre-B cells aren't gonna have any antibodies on the surface. And then matures are gonna have Ds as well, and then it can go out into circulation. So just know what goes with what. Like I said, again, I illustrated it in my condensed notes if you don't wanna write it out yourself. Now, this is what I was saying. I don't know how many, I think, I forget if it was 50, I think it was like 500 different segments. But if you combine those in different variations, you get millions and millions of different keys, right? Different teeth on the keys. Just in case you come across it, you can address it, okay? So it's a crazy process, but that's kind of how it goes. So this is this hypermutation process. So once you actually get um, the uh, something sim that could almost fit the key or almost fit the lock, you can you can um, you can hypermutate it, and again, aid is going to aid in this hypermutation process. Um, did I have okay? Uh, I think I had another. Okay, yeah, there. Okay, let's make sure it's there. Um, so aid is going to help in this hypermutation process. So what you're trying to do through this, you you're, you're trying to fine tune the antibody to make sure it fits as tightly as possible. Okay, to the antigen in circulation. So as it says here, you will talk about this CD4040L later on, but uh, the point I wanted to make is aid. Aid will help with class switching and aid will help with somatic hypermutation. Definition, know it. What does air do? Air helps with negative, uh, negative selection. Aid helps with class switching and somatic hypermutation. I mentioned hyper-M syndrome. It's an issue class switching. Uh, yeah. All right, any questions?